What's good, everybody? Welcome back to BTM to the Basketball Time Machine, the show about former NBA players of the 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s. Today, I'm really looking forward to the conversation to my guest to the podcast. But before we get to him, if you want to have more podcasts like this one, please subscribe to my channel and help my channel to grow. So today's guest is an NBA champion. He played in the NBA from 1994 until 2002. Dickie Simpkins, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, man. Appreciate it. So, do you still follow the NBA? Yes, I follow the NBA very thoroughly. Um, I actually, actually, I, I, I actually scout. I actually scout for the Washington Wizards. Um, I was scout. I was scouting for the Charlotte Hornets for the past eight years, and now I scout for the Washington Wizards. So, I watch basketball because I scout talent all the time. Okay. Do you have um, any player, any team you like? And do I have a favorite team? Yeah, it would be the Washington Wizards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you would have said something else, that would have been strange, okay? Right. Um, yeah, you came in at a very difficult time for the Bulls. Michael Jordan had retired and the team went through many changes. How difficult was it for you to find your role on the team? Well, you know, I, I came in, I, yes, you're right. I came in where MJ had just retired. They had just lost in the first round of the playoffs to the Knicks. The dynamics of the team and the players had changed. When I got there, I think Randy Brown came the same year I did. Ron Hopper came. Um, so obviously it was some different dynamics in the change, uh, but it was still a veteran team for the most part. I was the youngest guy on the team. I think the next youngest guy was Corey Blunt. And then everybody else on the team was married and had been in the league for a while, married with kids. So... Um, the transition was different. You, I was coming to a team that had championship history, um, had obviously Hall of Fame players on the on the team, and um, you know finding your place as a young kid to a veteran team is definitely a difficult challenge. But I believe, and I know that the veterans helped me transition. You know, um, Pete Myers was on the team. He kind of really helped me transition and, and, you know, taught me the things that I needed to know. Ron Harper did the same thing. Randy Brown did the same thing. And uh, they kind of looked at me as their rookie or their rook is what, I, what they would call us back in the day. And then that was the same year. It's funny how things change immediately or change quickly. That was the same year that MJ came back. So he had been practicing with us. Nobody knew. We were supposed to keep it pretty quiet. And when MJ came back, he kind of um, took me under his wing as his rook also. He saw how hard I was working, and he saw my abilities, and, and that I was a good listening rookie and learning, and um, he respected that and kind of took me under his wing too. So that was a big moment. So although I was young on a veteran team, the transition was a challenge, but those veterans helped me transition pretty smoothly. In hindsight, would you have preferred to be on a weaker team in order to receive more playing time? Uh, in hindsight, I would say no. I would say no because um, I had just come from winning the Big East tournament, winning the Big East, you know, just come from winning the Big East conference in, in college basketball. Um, I had been in you know, in winning environment. So in the 1995-96 season, um, you actually started 12 games. Was it a different kind of pressure in those games, being a starting lineup? No, it wasn't any pressure at all. Actually, I was excited to have my legit opportunity. Um, Dennis got hurt. He, had, he strained a calf muscle, which was going to put him out, put him out for like, I don't know, it was like a month and a half. And so that was my opportunity. Phil and uh, Phil started uh, put me in the starting lineup. I knew what my role was. The veterans embraced me, and um, that was one of the that was one of my um, one of my top exciting moments with the Bulls and with those teams was the ability to have that opportunity to start and to play a lot of minutes. Um, and I thought I performed well thought I performed well and then obviously when Dennis came back you know obviously he was going to be back in the starting rotation and then that put me back to 
you know, spot spot minutes here and there, spot times coming in the game. So that was a difficult piece to be able to try to deal with. The fact that I got all of, all those games of playing considerable minutes and starting and performing, and then now going back to, you know, I may play, I may not play. So that was difficult, but I enjoyed that moment. There was no pressure at all. I mean, can't have any pressure. I'm playing with the greatest players in the game, and, uh, you know, I do my job, just do my job, do my role, and they'll make the game easy, and it was fun. All right. So uh, yeah, you just mentioned Phil Jackson. Um The Bulls probably had one of the best supporting casts of all time. How did Phil Jackson make the team understand that everybody on the team has an important role? I mean, it was pretty simple. I mean, like I said, the team was a veteran team, all professionals that had been playing for a while. Everybody knew their role, and it was easier for it was easy for Phil to get everybody to understand that because we had a leader in MJ that set the tone. So whenever you're a coach, whenever you're a coach and you have an unbelievable leader, you know, that makes it easier the, the, that makes it easier to coach guys and get guys to understand their role for the ultimate goal of winning. So Phil was, uh, you know, he was all about the mental and uh, all about the mind. And, you know, it, you have veteran players, you have an unbelievable leader. Everybody knows their role and everybody's on the same page for one common goal of winning the championship. It made Phil's job easier for every to manage everybody. All right. Uh, you mentioned Dennis Rotman earlier. What do you think when the Bulls announced that they yeah, acquired Dennis Rotman? Um, at the time, I didn't know Dennis Rotman. I just only knew what his abilities were and, and, how, and what he had done in the NBA as an unbelievable rebounder, um, an eccentric personality off the court. So I didn't really know Dennis Rodman. So I thought, it, you know, I said to myself, this is going to be interesting. And um, when Dennis came to the team, got to know him and uh, watched him work. And Dennis is actually, you know, the, the things, the perception of him in the media, some of it was, you know, still the same. But for the most part, um, Dennis was a good guy. I mean, he was a good guy. And I remember when I was starting those games, I was starting those games in the second season when he was hurt. And I remember we were on a plane after one game and he came and sat down next to me and asked me how I felt like I was doing. And then he talked to me about some different things, gave me some pointers and, and, um, you know, he said that I was doing a good job. So I thought that was big. Wow. I thought that was big of Dennis and, um, uh, it was good learning from Dennis and watching him work and doing his job. Wow. All right. Um, How intense was practice with Michael Jordan, Dennis Rutman, and Pippen? Practice was intense every day. Um, I don't know if people know, but MJ practiced all the time. He didn't sit out of practice. In, in order for him to sit out of practice, Phil would really have to force him to take a day off. But MJ never wanted to sit out of practice. He made the practice environment as competitive as the game. He talked trash in the practices like he did in the game and everybody competed at a high level. So the practice was, the beginning of the practice was, was a, was a mental grind because we, it was all mental with just going through the triangle offense, the options, different reads and reactions. And then the second half of practice was competition plan. And it was always intense. All right. Wow. Who was your favorite teammate during the Bulls days? Man, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if I, I mean, like, you know, Ron Hopper was a good teammate. You know, he took me under his wings. Like I said, Randy Brown was a good teammate. Pete Myers was a funny teammate. He was hilarious. Um, James Edwards, when he came to the team, he, he took me under his wing and he was an unbelievable veteran teammate to learn under and how he embraced me. And then um, Robert Parrish, man. Robert Parrish, I had watched oh, Robert yeah. Parrish growing up. I had watched him growing up when I was younger playing for those Celtics teams. And I always just thought Chief was just a mean dude. <laughs> and when he came to the team, um, Chief was just an unbelievable professional Good dude, down to earth guy, 
and he embraced me also. I remember my uh, my wife threw a surprise birthday party for me at the house, nice. and uh, I came in the house, and who do I see standing there? It was seven foot chief in my house at my surprise <laughs> birthday party. So um, it was just a good. I mean, so those guys. I mean, everybody was Tony was a good guy. I mean, everybody was. Uh, I can't really say a favorite. I mean, like Chief was unbelievable. And to be able to play with a Hall of Famer like Chief, James Edwards was unbelievable. Pete Myers was super funny. Randy was Randy was um, a great teammate. Ron Hopper was fun to uh, to learn from. I mean, Steve Kerr, Tony Kukos, Judd Bushalo, they were great guys. Again, you almost have the entire got, roster. <laughs> yeah, you got to remember that. Luke Longley was unbelievable. Again, you got to remember all those guys were in a different phase of life than I was at that time. Yeah. But but for them to take the time out to embrace me and it was just we had a we had a team of unbelievable guys, man. That's what made the that's what the, that was a big piece of what made things work. Everybody was unbelievable, everybody knew their role, everybody was professional, everybody was down to earth. Wow, sounds great. So after a brief stay with the Golden State Warriors in nineteen ninety seven, you returned to the Bulls, the post Jordan Pittman Rutman era, and you received way more playing time and had the probably the best season of your career. What do you remember of that season? Yeah, so I got traded to the Golden State Warriors. Um, and the way I was looking at it was I had won two cha I had been with two championship teams, and now it was kind of like the time for me to get an opportunity to sh be able to play now. And you asked about hindsight, <laughs> and I was telling you in hindsight, um, you asked me about whether going to a more lesser team and – Well, I got traded to a lesser team because Golden State wasn't the Golden State that it is today. We were losing, and it was, you know, it was just not a good environment at the time. And so, <laughs> you know, I'm there. The next thing I know, you know, they're waving me. As soon as they wave me, my agent calls me and says, um, uh, Jerry Krause had called them because, nice. Phil, because Phil Jackson and MJ – wanted me back on the team and um you know in like a week or two later i'm back in chicago back on the team and again because i was a listener because i knew my role because i was a rookie that they taught and uh embraced me it all comes back full swing and now i get my opportunity and i'm ready for my opportunity And I just had to wait my time, which is a difficult thing to deal with. But I got my legit opportunity to play and play more minutes and really continue to show my abilities. And it was unbelievable going on it, going into a third championship. So it was like a it was like a sigh of relief when, you know, the Golden State time was over shortly. It was, you know, it was a short time there. And then the Bulls were calling for me to come back. It made me feel you know, unbelievably great and appreciative that they appreciated my abilities and my and my work ethic and the things that I brought to the table to want me to come back. Wow. All right. Thanks. Looking back on your career, who was the toughest player you ever had to guard and why? I remember my rookie year, my first game I ever started. I started a game, I want to say November, it was against the Phoenix Suns, Charles Barkley. Oh, And I grew up. I grew up, and Charles Barkley was one of my favorite players because he kind of played my position, and um, he was very difficult to guard that game. And uh, but I, 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 it was like wow. My first game started, and I'm going against a Hall of Famer, Charles Barkley, a guy who was one of my favorite players when I was younger. So he was difficult to guard, um, just because of his craftiness and ability to score. And uh, all the crafty moves he would use against young guys. Kevin Garnett was difficult to guard um, because of his height, his length, and just mm -hmm. his talent. Even though he was difficult to guard, and um, you know Shaq was difficult to guard because I had to defend like three different positions. I would have to defend small forwards sometimes, power forwards, and center. So. Wow. I would say those three guys were difficult to guard, and I would probably throw in like Otis Thorpe because he was so strong. Otis Thorpe, okay. 
Didn't yeah. expect that name. <laughs> yeah, man. See, if people don't know, Otis Thorpe, man, he's an NBA champion and actually a Providence College alum. All right. <laughs> so, well, I would say those guys stand out. As, I mean, obviously it was some difficult matches, but I would say those guys stand out as difficult guys to guard. Okay. If you could do it all over again, what would you change? If I could do it all over again, um, I would probably change um, my approach. My approach mentally in the times that I didn't understand why I wasn't playing. I would have changed uh, my mental understanding a little bit more. But it's difficult when you're young to understand that. But I would have tried to figure out a better way to understand it better. Um, that's one thing I would change. Other than that, I wouldn't change anything. Any ba or every basketball player who can imagine how tough it is not to play and to accept it. Yeah. Yeah, not and and not to accept it where you're satisfied you're not playing, but to accept it and understand more that your time will come. Just be prepared versus you're not playing and woe is me and feeling sorry for yourself. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Wow. So we're finally, yeah, at my favorite question. <laughs> your top six of all time but only one player per position, and you have one sixth man. So it's one point guard, one shooting guard, one small forward, one power forward, and one big. Well, shooting guard, obviously, MJ. Okay, let's get, MJ, that out the way. get that Let's get that out of the way, and MJ is the greatest player to play the game, and that's not just because I played with him. Um, so let's get that out of the way. Point guard, um, man, I don't think I've ever really thought about this. That's why I'm asking this. Yeah, I don't think I've ever really thought about top five, but point guard, um, hmm. Let's come back to point guard. Let's okay. go let's go small forward. Um let, let, let me let me rephrase the question. Maybe not even your top six ever, but maybe the players that you like the most or you enjoy watching yeah, the most. Let, let, Yeah, let's not go on. Let's not go on position because the guys I can pick that I would pick, they can. This be this would be my top five and six guys just in general that we would just go out and play. But MJ, LeBron, um, Larry Bird, and uh, uh, MJ, LeBron, Larry Bird, Hakeem Olajuwon. And that's four guys, right? And uh, probably Tim Duncan. Wow. <laughs> and my sixth guy, and my six, and my sixth guy would be my sixth guy would probably be um, Kevin Durant. Wow. Okay, actually, your top five is exactly the same. As mine, with only one exception, I don't have LeBron on my top five. But all the other guys, great to hear that somebody appreciates Hakeem Olajuwon. Wonderful. <laughs> Because to yeah, me, yeah. Uh, even though everybody says he's a Hall of Famer and he's a champion, everything, I still believe he's under underrated. I think many people don't realize how special that guy was. Yeah, I, I agree with you. He is underrated. He's very special. People don't really realize all the different things and how he affects how he affected so many different categories in the stat, on the stat sheet. Yeah. Do you have a funny story out of your playing days? Um, we're playing the San Antonio Spurs. Uh, this was after I came. No, I can't remember if it was before or after I came back from Golden State, but we're playing the San Antonio Spurs. I'm in the game. It's right before halftime. Rebound comes off. It goes into MJ's hands. The clock is running down before the half. We're on the break now. MJ's dribbling the ball down the middle. He has le he has Scotty on his left wing, and he has me on the right wing. 
So naturally, you're thinking first option is MJ shooting this ball, right? <laughs> Second option, you're thinking, okay, if he doesn't have a shot, he's going to pass it to to Scotty. And you're figuring I'm probably not an option at all, right? <laughs> Clock's running down, five, four, three. MJ kicks it to me on the right wing, and I shoot a three off the one leg, bank it <laughs> off the glass, bank it off the glass, and it goes in at the buzzer at halftime. And then I, I keep running off the court into the locker room like <laughs> like this is what I do on a regular basis. And then when and then and then you can just see the team is smiling and laughing. Then when everybody gets in the when everybody gets in the locker room, I tell MJ, you made the right decision. <laughs> so that, 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 that's a funny story. I always tell everybody that story. That's a funny moment. Did he even expect getting the ball? <laughs> I don't even expect he was going to throw me the ball. Like I said, I'm thinking he's going to just shoot this himself. Or at worst case scenario, he's throwing it to Scotty for the shot. He threw it to me as the clock was running down, and I delivered. <laughs> wow. At, at least it shows even though you didn't expect the ball, you were still ready. I was ready. I was ready. <laughs> Thanks for the story, man. Um, what will you tell the youth today? What does it take Yeah, to be a professional, what does it take to not only to make it to the NBA, but also to stay in the NBA? Because many young players don't realize that there's not only making it there, but staying there is just as tough. Um, I, I just I always just tell, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's making it to the NBA. It doesn't matter if it's life. It doesn't matter if it's basketball. I just always tell kids, my bad. I just all I always tell kids or tell the youth, um, uh, perfect perfect preparation. I'm sorry, proper preparation builds proper instinct. I just tell them proper preparation bring builds proper instinct. If you if you get the proper reps in, then you're going to react instinctively. You're going to instinctively react, and you're going to trust your work. You know so. That's what I tell them. Like, and don't so don't expect to don't expect to react instinctively if you're not getting in the proper reps. So don't expect to be able to make shots if you're not really working on your game like that. Or don't expect to do something out here in life if you're not really working on it. So I just always tell people, proper repetition is going to build proper instinct in anything that you do. All right, Dickie Simpkins, thanks a lot for being on the show. No problem, man. Thank you, man, and uh, much success to you and your show, man. All right?